Welcome to the Patron Saints of Pop Culture Podcast. I'm Miguel Covarrubias. And I'm Kathy Covarrubias. And today, let's talk about pop culture and community. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Don't forget to review and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform. Today, we are talking about how stories shape our communities. Bringing out the best in fandoms. And whatever else our live audience has to ask us. Uh... For those of you who are listening to this after the fact, we are doing this live as a way to kind of say, hey, we're all in this together. So We're all in this together. That's the only thing I can think of anytime anybody anybody says says it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. This is what happens when you grow up during the era of High School Musical. Which one? The first one, because I'm old. (laughs) Okay. Um, Yeah, that makes me feel ancient. But yes, uh, we're all in this together during this time of isolation and everything else. We thank you so much for uh, picking up the show after the fact, if you are listening to us after the fact. Um, this is uh, what we've been trying out this season. We've been trying out uh, a new format to kind of see how pop culture interacts with Hi, Trish. Um, <laughs> our world and kind of things we did talk about, how pop culture and romance Go together mm-hmm. um, a few – well, about a month ago. Yeah, during uh, Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day week. And so um, let us know if you actually like this. So yeah, yeah, we'll do more live videos. I'll put on makeup occasionally. It'll well, be all right. <laughs> not just the live video, but uh, also the uh, format of the podcast that we're doing. Yeah. Just the different thing. So um, let's talk about how our stories shape our community. So, brief history, kind of, uh, I really wanted to talk about this primarily because of my own experience and where I grew up. You know, I grew up in uh, the Christian church. I grew up in an evangelical community. And, uh, you know, I really, I really noticed how those are really based around the stories that are told, Mm -hmm. primarily the Bible stories and, you know, like, even though people think it's like just Sunday school, like children's stuff, like Noah and the Ark and, and stuff like that. Um, have you noticed really kind of how those stories kind of shape those communities? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you can even argue that like within a church, those stories are connected with like different groups within the church. Mm-hmm. Like, like you were saying, like Noah is very much like a, like little kid, like themed, group you know what i mean i I don't think there's a single nursery that i went to in (laughs) any of the churches that didn't have like noah and the ark stuff because you had animals so and everybody loves the animals they're cute well (laughs) well most of them are cute everything that's sticking out to me is like two giraffes like going onto a big boat (laughs) or elephants or elephants Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um those are really kind of the hardest animals to to like paint too like why did everybody decide to do that Uh Um, Stretching their creative juices. You know that, or, you know, you had those weird churches that had Daniel in the lion's den. Oh, yeah. Like, why? It's not a good story. Yeah, it is. (laughs) It's inappropriate. Well, it's kind of uh, scary for little kids, that's for sure. Yeah. I actually just finished a book, uh, a book of short stories by Ken Liu. And uh, it's, he is uh, the person who just, uh, translated the three body problem which became very popular in the west it inspired a whole lot of articles what do you mean by the three body problem uh the three body problem is the name of the book oh okay (laughs) Uh, is the name of the book that uh, became really popular in the west it's um one that you maybe heard about on another podcast uh somewhere else and a lot of them were talking about it like uh um most of the stuff podcasts had uh had conversations around this book and um, he said in the very beginning of the book about how authors and readers are co-writers of a story that you guys can that it's it's both and it's not a it's not a really an either or and he really wanted to to gather stories that made him feel most at home mm-hmm. because he he said as an author it's really difficult to Right, thinking of what what's going to make somebody else feel at home, what's you know going to be something that somebody else would be able to take this and rearrange the furniture and make it like theirs, their own. 
Which and we do as as consumers of media. Right? I was about to say, like, Harry Potter is, like, a big one, obviously, because I love Harry Potter. But, like, yeah. especially with um, J.K. Rowling being a little bit more problematic, um, especially recently, a lot of her diehard fans have been a little disappointed in some things that she said. Um, so a lot of us have decided, like, it's fine. Like, we can still love Harry Potter for everything that Harry Potter has brought to us. Without necessarily liking the author like herself. Yeah. Because we've made it our own. Well, that's one of the biggest things about it is that story in and of itself is a religion. That we are, we as human beings, not just human beings, I'm sure, but, uh, you know, we don't know if alien <laughs> communities exist out there, but, um, Humans are very narrative based creatures that we really, you know, we really strive to have things make sense. Mm -hmm. Well, and we really want like stories for ourselves too. Like, I mean, that's something that one of the things that people do as soon as you meet them is like, hey, what's your story? Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, that's the very first thing that you usually ask. Mm -hmm. Like, what's your story or why are you oh, here? Yeah. To tell, you know, their story mm -hmm. of, uh, how they came to be in the same vicinity as you. Yeah. Hopefully six feet away because, you know, we are social distancing at the moment. Not us because we share a bed. So. <laughs> we already have each other's germs. Have, yes, it's fine. So, and each of these stories really shape us and shape who we are. And this is the thing that I love about entertainment is that, that each of these fandoms kind of make that story their own. They make mm -hmm. it their home. And they invite other people into their home and that home becomes more of a community and that as it grows bigger and bigger and bigger, sometimes it gets to be a little unwieldy, unwieldy. Yeah. Like for instance, Harry Potter, there isn't just one set of Harry Potter, you know, fandom nerds. Yeah. Like there are the ones that do the Quidditch thing and they're the ones that do you know like uh harry potter role play uh, live action role play mm -hmm. larping and, in the park yes and then there's also the you know other group that does like harry potter and the sacred text and then there's the other group that is very into like pottermore too yeah. mm -hmm. so yeah there's like subsets of like the whole fandom and, well it's it's that's i think really how we got our denominations within the church is that I think. Oh, they're like different fandoms. Yeah, they're different ah. fandoms. <laughs> like they're different things of the story that really were pulled out for them. That makes sense. Like let's, let's step away from Harry Potter. So let's, let me ask you this question then. It's really hard for me to do. I know. <laughs> what story do you most base your life on? And Aside it from Harry Potter. It can't be Harry Potter. Um, and it can't be Harry Potter? It can't. Well, if it's Harry Potter, then you have to explain why. Oh, gosh. Um, okay. Other story that I base my life on. I guess another one that I kind of like connected with, like in my formative years, would be like The Hunger Games. Okay. Because, um, I don't know, during that time, there was a lot of like dystopia young adult novels coming out and I felt like it was a little bit more mature than like the Twilight crowd, mm -hmm. you know, and um, the heroine is very like self-sacrificing and really wants to do what's good for her community and not just her community. Like, well, at the beginning, it's mostly her community, yeah. but then she like broadens it to all of Pan Am. So hi, Ashley. Um, so I guess I would, it would be that one because I always, would picture myself as being somebody who would step into like self sacrifice for somebody else in that type of situation. Yeah, I see that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I'll just braid my hair. I'll be Katniss. <laughs> I can learn how to shoot a bow. Well, Katniss was our very first uh, saint from pop culture mm -hmm. on the website. Um, I haven't written any of those recently, but I did make a few of them this this year to kind of go along with our podcast. Um, Obviously, I haven't had time to write. So, <laughs> well, you'll have plenty of time if our day job closes. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, for me, it uh, well, Star Trek. Oh, I yeah. mean, yeah, yeah, it's definitely Star Trek. Oh, I should have said Star Trek. That's okay. <laughs> All right, it's okay. Um, 
and most definitely was uh, Picard. Picard and Riker were my role models growing up. Picard, Riker, and Data, like, that's the holy trinity to me. Like, I'm serious. No, I, I, I know. I'm just laughing because, I mean, you're adorable. So. <laughs> well, because I have the Riker beard now, you know. Uh, yeah. I do kind of look like Jonathan Frakes, except with less hair. So. Sure, yeah. <laughs> have you ever ridden a bike? <laughs> oh, God. Okay. Sorry, um, I touched my face. Don't touch your face, people. So... I think this is this is essential to a lot of uh, pop culture themes. Uh, I know that uh, there is one movie, especially that uh, really pulls shows this in uh, in essence how stories can be manipulated to use to use people. Um, for instance, this would be um, the Book of Eli would be one where the book, quite literally, the book, uh, even though it turns out to be a Braille Bible or something. Uh, I can't remember. Is used uh, as a form of manipulation for the community because nobody else could read it. So, you know, he was like, hey, why don't we use this to manipulate people? Yeah, don't do that. Don't manipulate people. Well, we saw, you know, instances of this in um, Kenya. And this is something that uh, Kenya was uh, had a big issue a few years ago with uh, – with wars, with uh, genocide and things that were going on, and those stories were not being told. And that was the important thing that uh, most of the people in the country saw was that their stories weren't being told. People who were refugees, people who were being uh, shoved away from their their families, uh, reasons they had to run. And so uh, this one entrepreneur, uh, he put together a website to um, – oh, 1984. That's a good one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, yes, again, we're doing this live, so. <laughs> they know that. They um, can see comments too. <laughs> yes. No, I'm saying for our, our uh, podcast listeners, because mm. I'm not going to edit some of those things out. Um, it would take too much time for me to go back and do that. Um, but, uh, anyway, he started this website for people of Kenya to, to share their stories. And, uh, it became really popular, became the stories, uh, it became really the story of the country, story of Kenya. And, uh, it was, it was very transformative for the whole country. And that's what I would say is, is a good way that story is used to really help people, mm-hmm. help to build a community or rebuild in that case. Then you have the Ukraine. Now, I would assume that most of our listeners are from the United States and they know what has going, been going on in the Ukraine, uh, especially with when it comes to misinformation and why um, people have uh, blamed Ukraine for the whole 2016 uh, Democratic server. I have no idea what the, the whole conspiracy theory is. No, uh, my brain is now consumed with uh, coronavirus instead. So all of that information got pushed out. So, yeah, it I was impeachment, remember. then coronavirus. And yes. coronavirus is kind of taking up more of the space in the brain. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a little bit more life-threatening <laughs> right now. Well, uh, one of the things that uh, happened in the Ukraine was that there was so much fake fake news, quite literally fake news, that was being put out. And uh, they started teaching in schools, in mostly in elementary schools and middle schools, in how to – spot fake stories in how how you can uh, kind of dissect a story and really find the little pieces of that. And I think this is what I would say is a, is a bad example. I'm going with a good, bad, and ugly because, ah. you know, that's who I am. I'd have pop culture references. It's fine. It's okay. Um, but they they saw that there was a bad problem with, with stories, with fake stories of uh, – culture that were going on there and it was really kind of creating this this weird like like anti-government kind of uh, thing going on in Ukraine which we know now that uh, a lot of Russia's Russia's propaganda in other countries is to destabilize the main government that's there by misinformation in fact, it's going on now with the coronavirus. A lot of that misinformation stuff that's that's circulating on social media is from Russia. It's Russia propaganda. 
And so, you know, that's one of the things that, that was bad about it. Mm-hmm. But one of the good things that came out of that was that in the Ukraine, those kids now know how to spot a fake story. Yeah. Well, and um, I think that we as like a whole like civilization on earth uh, needs to go ahead and take the steps to actually learn what um, is good information and bad information mm-hmm. and good sources and bad sources. Um, I think that a lot of people just, you know, they'll see like a screenshot of like – one little bit of an article, and then they take it and run with it without actually doing any additional research to see, like, where did the writer get this information? And is there other sources to back them up? Um, which is really important, in my opinion, to do. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. I'm pretty smart. Now, the <laughs> really ugly part of this is when people are completely manipulated by a story. Um, and I'm going to I'm gonna be talking more about this, but it's when it's when you you've become a part of a community and you're, you're too afraid to actually speak against the community that, you know, even when something's going wrong and this, I mean, this is cult behavior. That's when you need to call somebody, you know, and uh, yeah, call your dad. That, you're thank you. <laughs> um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yes. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's really that cult like behavior. And this, we see this in America now with uh, our current president who is a cult of personality cult of personality in and of himself. Um, it's, it's a lot of groupthink and it's, it's a bad groupthink. Mm-hmm. It's, it's when the loudest voices get their say. And this is a bad thing. Like we all have probably those, that coworker that we just can't stand because he's just going off about how Trump is the greatest or I know our dog misinformation really on just the, needs to shut up. I know. <laughs> I misinformation on uh, the uh, coronavirus or anything else, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And then they end up being the one that's the loudest in the group and they form how the group reacts to things. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a weird kind of group think mentality. Um, do you have any examples of a uh, story in, in this way, in this? That like developed a group think? Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, um, kind of, sort of. It's not really pop culture, but, um, it is kind of like, an origin story that kind of built people together. So I was watching um, uh, Dirty Money on Netflix, and their first episode of season two has to do with Wells Fargo. And one way that Wells Fargo got all of their employees like to be on their side was to tell their origin story. Um, you know, Wells Fargo um, not only was in baking, but also they were a company that you would hire – to take you across the country, mm-hmm. you know, give you safe passage. Um, they, of course, would deliver packages. They were like the first like UPS. Um, <laughs> and um, yes, hello, Sarah. <laughs> um, and then um, with that kind of like, you know, gung, like gumshoe, like mentality, like we've been around for so long, like that really built up a lot of pride with their employees. Um, and off of that... Um, with people having so much dedication to Wells Fargo, they were able to convince a lot of employees to do some really shady stuff, like open up fraudulent accounts yeah. and um, trick people into signing away for credit cards and that kind of stuff. Um, so, and, and would all go up to, you know, we're doing this because we're trying to help the consumer. Like that was their whole story was we're here to help the consumer. We wouldn't sell products to them that wouldn't be beneficial to them. You know, that in itself is a story, right? Yeah. I know it's kind of – sorry, I'm a little – I go out on tangents when it comes to, like, financial stuff, so, I'll, you know. <laughs> no, no, that – I mean, that's that's a good example. And uh, I'm going to give you my example here now in a that's form of actually pop a, culture? Uh, yeah, in the form <laughs> of a case study. And uh, this is the something that I just noticed recently, which um, we uh, we've talked about recently, too – is there are there are denominations of trekkies out there trekkies and trekkers in fact there there are two different things if you didn't know that there are I did not know star trekkers and star trekkies which um there is uh, it's forming a division t- here too it's primarily <laughs> those I well, didn't need to laugh. and those who who really adhere to the principles that were portrayed in each of the different series, like okay. um, 
for instance, Next Generation is different than um, the original series. Mm -hmm. The original series is more about, hey, you know, like it's Flash Gordon-esque, like more action, less, you know, like talky-talky. Yeah. Whereas Next Generation was much more, let's try to solve this diplomatically. And um, then you get to Discovery and Picard where the storytelling is is much more <laughs> – is much more on level with, uh, Ashley just <laughs> thinking, uh, much more on level with the, uh, combination of the two. Mm -hmm. It's saying, you know, there is a time for action. There's a time for diplomacy. There's a time for all of these things. And it's okay to, you know, be entertained by the action. It's also good to be entertained by the diplomacy because that's how we, that's Build. how we navigate our world. Yeah. And personally, um, I feel like that's kind of how I built my like character growing up because I would sit and watch Star Trek with my dad and my sisters mm -hmm. every Saturday. And, um, I just was it like super interested in the fact that everybody on the crew, like, even though they were, like, you know, different statuses, they mm -hmm. they were still treated like they were equals. You know, their opinions still mattered. Um, and I was very intrigued by that because that wasn't really in place in a lot of businesses at that point in time. I feel like now um, managerial styles have definitely changed and people are a little bit more willing to seek others' opinions. Yeah. Not, it doesn't matter, like, what position you are in the company. Like Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> and sorry, I, I'm talking a lot here and I'm, I'm trying to uh, to make this a little bit more conversational. It's okay. I know but, it's hard for you. <laughs> um, one of the biggest divisions that I noticed was especially over these new series, over Discovery and, oh, yeah. and um, Picard. People are mad. People are mad <laughs> primarily because they're showing real human beings rather than what Gene Roddenberry envisioned – as human beings of the 24th, 25th century. And they centuries. curse. They curse and they're, they're complex rather than having no interpersonal conflicts. Mm -hmm. Like humanity will never be able to evolve to the point where we're, you know, have no interpersonal conflicts. Well, and also too, I feel like, um, based on, well, like Riker, like he was very yes. much like, very much a ladies man and like that was on his brain like all the time you knew it and i feel like that that just couldn't fly in nowadays you know like we've evolved past that you know like almost way, every episode i know every episode but we have evolved more not completely obviously but we're a little yes. bit more aware about the way that he was treating women in that series and how it was not Okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. It's definitely sexual harassment. <laughs> well, speaking of sexual harassment, that's a lot of what was going on with this division between oh, yeah. people who are about the classic Trek, even though there's a big difference between the original series and Next Generation and even Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, for instance, or mm -hmm. Voyager, that, you know, people had problems with Discovery and Picard, primarily with Discovery because of certain strong female characters and the fact that they were the lead of the show rather than a male captain. Yeah. I know. I I, re I do remember um, there being people being all up in arms over Voyager too. So. Yeah. Yeah. Though Catherine Janeway is probably one of my favorite captains yeah. behind Picard. She's my hero. Picard's my hero. So. I know. It's okay. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I have to – Patrick Stewart is just – you know, I want him to be my adopted he, grandfather. He is our adopted grandpa and he just doesn't know it yet. Yeah. <laughs> if somebody out there knows uh, knows Patrick Stewart, let him know that he's our grandfather. <laughs> I'm sure he'll take it very well. Yeah, oh, but God, we're so weird. Speaking of, <laughs> speaking of fandoms, you have a couple of examples of some unusual fandoms that have been doing some – Good things. Yeah. So, okay. So, the world's been kind of crappy. <laughs> and I wanted to. Yes. Yes. But um, throughout what's been going on, um, especially in. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Ashley, what was your sir about? <laughs> I want to know before I continue. Sir pa Oh, Sir Patrick Stewart. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Sir Patrick Stewart. And you called him grandpa. I did. Shame. Uh <laughs> 
So I wanted to bring some good news to you about um, different fandoms within like their nerd sphere. Um, I have examples from YouTube groups and podcast groups, um, and then also uh, books and movies. Um, so to start off, I kind of wanted to go a little bit further in time, like before all this happened, um, with the nerd fighters. Now, the nerd fighters are the fa- – it's so hard to say. The nerd fighters are the fans of uh, Hank and John Green. Mm-hmm. Um, and – they kind of have, like, some footing in the Harry Potter community, too, but they're not, like, full-on, like, Harry Potter fans. But that's how they got really big is um, one of the brothers sang a song about Harry Potter, and then, like, everybody started following them. Um, what they have done with their platform uh, is that they do um, charity events. So they basically ask their fans, hey, what are some good charities that you guys want us to donate to? Um they ask their fans to make mm-hmm. a video, um, and then they also do like a like a live stream video um, yeah. thing for charity as well. So there you go. That's a good example. I'm not sure if it's still Pizza Must, but they they do. Oh yeah, Pizza Must. Yeah, um, yeah, live stream for charity and and stuff like and that. Pizza John. It's like like 48 hours of them live streaming, and it's just insane. It is insane. Yes. Um, and then also, too, with YouTube, there's also another group of fans called the Mythical Beasts, um, and they are fans of Good Mythical Morning. Um, and Good Mythical Morning, um, they also do uh, some charity giveaways. Um, they also have what's called the Will of Mythicality, and on the will, when you spin it, there's sometimes a chance for them to donate to charity, and then they go ahead and ask their fans to donate to the charity as well, too. Mm-hmm. So that's also pretty cool. Um and then another one more recent um, is the Murderinos. Um, the Murderinos are a fan group uh, for My Favorite Murder, which is a podcast. So if you like like true crime mm-hmm. podcasts, but like comedic side of true crime podcasts. And it's not everybody's cup of tea. Some people get offended by it. Totally cool. Um but there's a group of Murderinos in Cincinnati who have actually banded together during the outbreak of the coronavirus and they have given out um they've given out like free babysitting to people who need it during this time they've um, helped people find part-time jobs during this time uh they have given away toilet paper and food and all kinds of stuff so they really like banded together and said you know this is our community we want to make sure that we take care of our community yeah. And it was basically just complete strangers. The only thing that they had in common was the fact that they like funny murder shows. <laughs> yeah. That's that's the one uh that I used their catchphrase earlier is that you're in a cold call your dad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's yeah. very important. And also stay sexy and don't get murdered. I don't know if that's trademarked. Hopefully we don't get in trouble. <laughs> We're giving them credit, so we shouldn't get in trouble. Um and then of course there's the Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. Um Again, I'm going to plug them because I love them dearly. Um, Even though Casper seems to be stealing all of my dea- ideas. Casper's not stealing your ideas. Uh, well, they stole the Saints thing from us. They, they kind of did, but not really. They they redid it, so it's not really the same. Anyway, <laughs> so um, with Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, what they do is they read um, a chapter a week um, with a theme in mind, and then they come back and they discuss it. Um, oh yeah, and call your dad. That's another one of their faves is and call your dad. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I really like that because it gives a way to take a story and bring it more into a like sacred text space, like read it more like you would, um, a Bible or the Quran. Um, mm-hmm. so I kind of like it because I've gotten a lot of new insights on Harry Potter that I just didn't have before. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I kind of recommend try reading your favorite book in that way. And I think that they're going to come out with different books as well, too. Um, and then the last one that I have, uh, we actually know somebody who's in it. Do you want to talk a little bit more about it? Yeah, the 501st Legion. It's a group of Star Wars cosplayers who usually cosplay as stormtroopers mm-hmm. uh, for charity. Um, my brother is actually a one of the uh, 501st Legion, uh, Jordan. And his, he made his... Stormtrooper armor. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Like, he 
plug for him. He's a cosplayer and his yeah. stuff is amazing. We did, we did, uh, plug him when we talked about the Mandalorian. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, but again, he does have the, he does have Mandalore the Great armor and he also has a, the very first one that he made was the Stormtrooper armor. And, uh, and he's been doing charity events for that, uh, for a long time. I don't think he's going to for a little bit now. I I know that he's uh, been focused elsewhere on on other things and his career and things like that. So, um, yeah, but check him out. He's a textbook cosplay, textbook ninja cosplay, uh, on Facebook and, uh, other places. Um, but, uh, yeah, he was actually featured on Bungie for one of his, I can't even remember what the, the name of the thing is called from Destiny, but uh, Destiny's a video game, and uh, he cosplayed as, as one of those. <laughs> very specific. Yes, very specific. <laughs> All right. So um, do you guys have any other, like, pop culture groups that you know of that does, like, good work outside of just being fans? We'll wait for you guys to reply. Or any questions about uh, how story shapes uh, pop culture? Mm-hmm. Or if you want to, like, if you want to answer that question, you can too. Yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. All right. Ashley says, um, how do you feel like uh, simple books, movies give – oh, wait. I can't read it. It's, I'm not close enough. <laughs> how do you feel like simpler books slash movies like The Giver – Okay. Play into this. You know what? The Giver? I'm not quite sure that I've actually seen that. Or read it? Or read it's it. it's a book, too. Yeah, see? I didn't even know it was a book, too. Um, but I feel like everything everything plays into into this. I think it shapes who you are as a, as a person and how you interplay with your community, with the people that are in your circle. Primarily with, like, for instance let's take it back to religion is that the simple story of and Noah and the ark is, is that story of faithfulness of knowing that something was going to happen. Something good was going to happen. And no matter what, I think she's disappointed that we haven't read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey Robin. <laughs> yeah. I I need to read the book. Um, but uh, we'll, that, that'll be added to my list of things to read. Um, but I think with simpler, simpler stories, I think are the best because I think that we, we can fit ourselves into those a little bit better and, uh, we can ultimately, um, really pull out the themes of the story better in simpler things. Like for instance, uh, I just read, uh, Daniel Tiger to my son this evening <laughs> and, uh, that one, the theme was that grownups will come back and that's what you know he pulled from it was that i'm always going to come back you know and get him after his class that i'm there and so for me yeah i am uh more than happy to uh yeah tell him that i will always come back and that's a simple story so yeah um another thing i was thinking is that those um simple stories that we have are a little bit easier to actually hey daniel tiger is a good guy he has good moral stories to pass along to everybody. Um, but anyway, so the short, the smaller stories, I think, are also a way to build community because those are the stories that we can actually, like, share among friends. Um, I know that my mom had a couple of books of hers that she would pass along to, like, her group of friends. Yeah. Um, so kind of like a – it wasn't really, like, a book club because I wouldn't, like, sit and talk about it. But it was more of a, I love this. You need to read it. You're going to get something from it. And then she would pass it along. Um, and that way they would build a connection over that book. Well, I think this is kind of, uh, to talk about <laughs> more people haven't read, uh, The Giver. So that's, that's okay. That's okay. We're, we're uh, a good company. <laughs> for me, I, I think, like, for instance, The Shack, mm-hmm. why The Shack became so popular and why it was a horrible movie it was because it's simple and the author didn't mean it to be this big, like, revelation about you know god or whatever that it was more more of a uh, a story of how he understood the being of god to be and that's how i view the bible now exactly is that that's how those human beings who wrote that those texts how they viewed a deity to be like mm-hmm. and not all of them fit together. But that's a different story for a different day. Um Anna had a question. I'm going to yeah. try to find it again. Da, 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 da. 
Here we go. Anna says, um, how much do you think what's going on uh, currently will shape pop culture? Um, I think it's a little – yeah, you got rid of the comments. I've got it back. No. Oh, wait. Hold on. No. Don't worry. I'll, I'll just watch it on my phone. It's okay. <laughs> um, I think – well, speaking for myself here is that – these things do shape uh, pop culture quite a bit. Like, for instance, Love in the Time of Cholera, which is uh, plays very heavily into the movie Serendipity, um, is is something that really came up, you know, big after cholera. And the plague, you know, really shaped how pop culture, you know, kind of saw the world and saw how, you know, we're fragile. Humanity is fragile and culture is fragile. Mm-hmm. So I think that's really going to, you know, it, this, the coronavirus now is, is how ultimately how society is changing that societal norms, like packaging on food is definitely going to be changing, I mm-hmm. think. And that's going to be interesting to see how we're going to go forward now is everything's going to be in cardboard. I think. <laughs> I think that, um, we're going to see. Um, people view, like people viewing pandemics, um, a little bit more seriously. Yeah. Um, I think that there's been some things like recently that, that have come out before coronavirus that kind of like made light of it or didn't really give much serious to, like seriousness to it. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's going to be a topic that we can't touch on for just a little while because it's going to be like too close, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like how, um, 9 11 movies didn't come out until, a few years after. I still think that the first nine eleven movie was a little too soon, personally, but that's just me. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, there was one about how it was all a scam that uh, was perpetrated by uh, um, W. W. I don't think I watched. I didn't watch a lot of them because they made me sad, and I don't like to be sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Um, another. Oh, I had another question. Um. Or another thought, but I can't think of it now. What does Ashley say? Ashley asks, do you think this will change movie releases, how some movies are decided or released on demand or to streaming? Oh. Yes. Yes. Actually, I think that um, – and I know that movie theaters are going to, to hate this, um, but I really think that movie theaters have, have – hit their peak already and they're kind of dying out. Now, granted, there are some of us who like the whole experience of going mm-hmm. into a dark room and just turning off your brain for two hours. A dark room with a lot of strangers. Yeah. <laughs> who knows what'll happen? Unless you go to weird <laughs> showing times like we do. That's or true. There's been multiple the, times when we've been the only people in the, the theater. The only people in the theater. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> But I think that uh, movie theaters are on their way out. I think there will be a lot fewer of them. Um, here in Cleveland, there's, there's what, kind of three in our nearer area. Um, I mean, we do like the Willoughby one, and uh, Silver Spot is nice, but it's too expensive. Um, and there's one that's right across the street, and I think we've gone to that one less than uh, the other two. Yep. Um, I think that... Well, I mean, we kind of already been switching over to streaming. You know, yeah. Netflix, they come out with some pretty decent movies. Um, Hulu, not so much. They do more like TV, like good TV. Um, but Amazon Prime's also coming out with movies too. So I do think it's something that is going to be kind of like on the way out in terms of movie theaters, especially with Disney Plus now. You know, they went ahead and released Frozen 2 early because of this. So I don't see why it wouldn't happen in the future. Yeah, it's going to make the streaming wars uh, rather interesting, I would say, is uh, who gets the rights and how do they get the rights? Mm-hmm. Um, how much do they pay for the rights, I should say? Yeah. Um, primarily, think, because Netflix has been competing with Oscar-worthy movies, you know, it's it's really kind of on the cusp there. I think it's going to be changing really soon. Do you think like drive-in movie theaters will still like be around? Because I know that they had like a little bit of a comeback recently. Well, they have their niche as well. Um, I mean, yeah, it's fun. It's it's an experience. It's something that you know, if there's still one around, I would love to take Peter to. Oh, there is. Yeah, there yeah. is one. Okay. Yeah, well, that's something that we got to do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we need to wrap this up for the recording, and uh, but we'll continue to uh, stay on the live and and 
talk to those of us who are those who are watching all five of you so um so with all that being said we invite you to come and join the conversation bye